All right, today's going to be a more uh, doctrinal sermon. Uh, I'm going to be teaching you about the laying on of hands. Um, you know, some people, you know, they don't know, uh, you know, all the different aspects of laying on of hands, but in Hebrews chapter 6, the uh, chapter that Gershon just read, you'll see here that the laying on of hands is actually one of the uh, doctrine, the principles of the doctrine of Christ, as we read there in Hebrews 6. It says here, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. So he's, he's encouraging here in verse 1 that, hey, these are some fundamentals of the faith, but, you know, as believers, we want to be able to move on from the fundamentals of the faith and go on unto perfection, right? Like we talked about in spiritual growth. So we can see some of the principles of the doctrine of Christ. One of them is the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So that's salvation. That's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that repentance there is not repentance from sin and believing on Jesus Christ. It's repentance from dead works. Dead works are when people are trusting their works to get them saved. And they're called dead works because if you trust works to get you saved, they're not going to save you, right? So you turn from those dead works, you repent from those dead works, and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Repentance from sin is, is part of this bit, the going on unto perfection, right? That's the repentance of sin as you grow in your faith and you um, get the sin out of your life and you try and improve as a Christian. Of the doctrine of baptism. So you'll see there that, you know, why is it plural baptisms? Because there is the baptism with water and then there's the baptism of the Spirit. And these are things that people need to know about and, and there's differences there. And of laying out of hands, so that's what I'm talking about today, and of resurrection of the dead, so that's Jesus Christ dying and rising from the dead, that's the gospel in, in 1 Corinthians 15, and of eternal judgment, so you can see that hell there is one of the fundamentals of the faith, that the fact that if people are not saved, they spend an eternity in hell, it's an eternal judgment, and this will we do if God permit, and then the chapter goes on to something else. So today I'm talking about the laying out of hands, um, probably the only if most people think about the laying on of hands, they think it's like a Pentecostal thing, but it's not only a Pentecostal thing. But the Pentecostals probably have made it famous because when you think of laying on of hands, maybe in your head you get a picture of Benny Hinn, you know, swinging his jacket. And I always laugh when people, you know, they get those videos of Benny Hinn swinging his jacket and they add like fireballs and lasers and everything. People are falling over. Um, or maybe you've been to a, a Pentecostal service Right? And then they have a guest preacher come in and he's like laying his hands on people and saying, oh, you know, he's slaying people and then they'll, they'll line them up. I don't know, you guys have been to one of these. You, you don't need to go to one, but um, I've been to one when I was younger because I went to, we used to go to this Pentecostal church and they had this speaker come in and then, you know, they line everyone up and he's going and slapping everyone on the forehead and, you know, saying, oh, you know, he's giving the Holy Ghost to everyone. And then they're getting slain in the spirit. And then it's quite a freaky thing if you've never been there. It's like the people, they, they fall over and then they start like convulsing on the floor and some of them are just uncontrollably giggling and others are like, you know, you know speaking in tongues. I'll, I'll preach on that another week. Speaking in tongues where they're just like saying all this gibberish. But uh, what you don't see, uh, you know, on usually that's, you know, advertised on things, is the people that don't do anything. Yeah, just... Was I meant to fall over or was I... Um, a, lot, a lot of that happens as well, but of course, they'll say it's because that person didn't have enough faith, right? That person didn't have enough faith to go along with it. So, you know, what is going on there? Is it uh, demon possession? Is it just people faking it? Is it, you know, just acting? I think it's a combination of a lot of things. You know, I've heard a lot of stories where, you know, sometimes there are just actors in Benny Hidden conferences where people are just paid to just act. You know, and then other people I just, you know, think that's what they're meant to be doing. So they, they, they want it so bad that they, they just conform, right? And it's like what's happening today in, in our country. Like people just conform, just the social pressure. But I do sometimes think as well, it's just demon possession. Um, because I don't believe this uh, Pentecostal practice where they're trying to get it from the apostles has, has, uh, it has ceased. I believe it has ceased uh, for today. And I'll explain why as I get into the sermon. But there's more to the laying on of hands than just what people know today in what's practiced or what's, what's shown in the Pentecostal circles, right? So I'm going to go through the three different laying on of hands that we see in the Bible and, um, and we'll give you examples of all of them. So the first one, when it comes to laying on of hands, is actually a transfer of a blessing. You'll notice that even in the Gospels, 
where you know people would want Jesus to touch their children to, to, to give them a blessing right so you know there are these prophets that can transfer these blessings this is not just for, for anyone to do but generally you know people will copy this practice just if they want to bless somebody they might put their hands on them to to as a, as a visual indication of this transfer of blessings but I wanted to show you an example in particular in Genesis 48 and this is where Israel so Israel is, if you didn't know, is Jacob, right? So Jacob was, you know, you got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Jacob was renamed Israel, and that's where you get the, um, the nation of Israel named from. So it's an Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, who are these? So if you don't know the context of what's happening here, in Genesis 48, this is like at the, near the end of Genesis. Genesis is 50 chapters. And we know the end of Genesis when Joseph is ruling in Egypt and then the, Israel and, the, uh, and his children come and stay in Egypt because of the famine. And, and this is near the end here where Israel actually meets, you know, Joseph and his two sons that were born in Egypt, Ephraim and Manasseh. And um, Joseph actually received the blessing from Israel to carry on the line. I think it's because Simeon was the firstborn if I remember correctly, Simeon was the firstborn, but because he sort of slept with his um, father's wives on the rooftop, he lost that, that sort of double inheritance as the first son. So um, Joseph got that inheritance, and that's why when sometimes the 12 tribes of Israel, it includes Levi and has the tribe of Joseph, but other times it excludes you know, one of the tribes and has Ephraim and Manasseh, right? And these are the two sons of Joseph um, because he got that double portion of inheritance. So here is where Israel is, is laying his hands on them, um, you know, as Isaac did to uh, you know, uh, Jacob and receive that blessing. So he's presenting his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, to Israel, to Jacob, Joseph is. And Joseph said, verse 9, uh, said unto his father, they are my sons, right, whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age so that he could not see. So this, this situation is very similar to um, I, uh, you know, Isaac blessing Jacob and Esau, right? Like it was, he was at a point where he was old, he couldn't really see very well. And if you know the story of the blessing from Isaac to Jacob, you remember Rebekah tricked Isaac into, uh, into Isaac thinking that he was blessing Esau rather than Jacob. And that's how Jacob got the blessing. And, you know, there's a whole, this sermon's not about that, but maybe we'll preach on that another time where that whole situation of, you know, God told Rebecca, hey, the younger's going to, uh, the older's going to serve the younger. So it's like if God didn't tell Rebecca that, would Rebecca have tricked Isaac? And then it's just, it's just a messes with your head in terms of like God said it was going to happen, but it only happened because Rebecca did it. But would Rebecca have done it if God didn't tell her? And it's, uh, it's one of those uh, predestination questions of like how it works with God. God can see the beginning from the end. So, situation similar here. Joseph, Jacob, or Israel, saying he can't see very well. Right? Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face, and lo, God hath showed me also thy seed. What is he saying here? He didn't think, because you remember Joseph, uh, you know, when his brothers sold him off into slavery, and they, they, they took the coat of many colors and put blood on it. Remember, Israel thought that his son Joseph had died. So that's what he's saying here. I didn't think that I'd see you again, but here I get to see your children. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees. So you can see that they're, they're quite young, right? So you can, if you bring a child from, out, uh, from within your knees, I mean, maybe they're Abel's age, you know, maybe Noah's age. Small children. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand towards Israel's left hand and Manasseh in his left hand towards Israel's right hand and brought them near unto him. So it's specific that he's saying, you know, Ephraim's in his right hand, Manasseh's in his left hand. Why? Because he wanted Jacob to have Manasseh on his right hand and Israel on his left hand because when he blesses them, he wanted Manasseh to receive the main blessing, right? Because he was the older child. We see that a bit later in this chapter. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was his firstborn. So what the Bible is saying here is, is Israel 
uh, he purposely crossed them. So he knew that, that uh, Joseph wanted him to bless Manasseh as the older, but he switched it, right? So you can see here that he's laid, so now he's crossed his hands and laid his right hand on the one that's on Joseph's right, which is Ephraim, who was the younger. His left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads and let my name be named on them and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Right, so that was the blessing that passed on. Because, you know, the blessing sort of passed on from Abraham to Isaac to, you know, Jacob to Israel. Now Israel is passing it on to Joseph's children and um, particularly passed it on to Ephraim. Verse 17, when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. Why? And he held up his father's hand. So after the blessing, he's like, lifts his father's hand up to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. So he did it. Do you see how he did it purposefully? It wasn't an accident, right? He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh. Now, I'm not 100% sure whether this was of God that he did this, or whether, you remember, Jacob was the younger of Esau and Jacob, remember? And he got the birthright. So I wonder whether there's a bit of play there that he knew that the older was in front of his right hand, but then he also decided to switch it up because he was the younger ruling over the elder in terms of Israel ruling over Esau. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh, even though Manasseh was the older. So interesting story there. Um, but just giving you an example here of one way we know about the laying out of hands, and that is a transfer of blessing. All right. Number two is the, the one that we mainly talk about is the transfer of spiritual gifts, right? So this is the one where people still think happens today. I don't. I'll explain why. Um, but the, the, what I'm going to talk about in this category is not just the transfer of spiritual gifts, but also they would use the laying out of hands to execute their spiritual gift as well, sometimes if they had one, right? So in Acts 28, we see in verse 8, and it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So you see, they had the power to heal people back in the early church when they had these spiritual gifts. And the way they would symbolically, you know, sort of show that they were utilizing this spiritual gift when it comes to the laying out of hands to either pass on a spiritual gift from the Holy Ghost or to heal, they would lay their hands on on somebody so back in the early church there were a lot of these spiritual gifts um, that were given unto the early church mark 16 15 we see the great commission here but we also see the different uh sort of miraculous things they were able to do uh, in the early church and he said unto them go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be damned. So this verse is not saying that you need to be baptized to be saved, just making a statement that if somebody believes and is baptized, they are saved. But it clarifies here, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So we see that the, the key aspect of salvation is, uh, is faith, right? And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So some people think that these are things that still happen today and I think they're just not taking the whole New Testament into account, right? So even though it's tied in with the Great Commission, you know, the Great Commission was given to the apostles, but we know that the apostles told us to do as they did, right? Which is, you know, like Paul said, to follow him as he follows Christ. So there are things that we are to do. 
Now, what I'm not saying is, I don't believe that, I don't believe that miracles no longer happen. Now, can miracles still happen? Of course. You know, can God supernaturally do things, supernaturally allow things to happen? Yeah, of course, miracles can still happen. I'm talking about this specific practice of in the early church where the apostles had the power to intentionally, right, lay their hands on somebody and impart a spiritual gift, impart the Holy Ghost a spiritual gift to other believers. And that's what we sort of see as they spoke with tongues and they, you know, could take up, you know, they could do these things, right? They could speak in tongues. They have interpretation of tongues and, and whatnot. 1 Corinthians 12, we're given a list of some of these spiritual gifts that were able to be imparted through the laying out of hands of the apostles. It says here in verse 7, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given the Spirit, the word of wisdom. So sometimes it's just supernatural revelation, right? To, a, to another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. Some, had, some were given more faith than others, even through as a, as a spiritual gift. To another, the gifts of healing. So that's the one we see Paul execute when he laid his hands um, um, previously here in Acts um, 28 with the father of Publius. Gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Verse 10, to another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy, right? So they could, they could even say what was going to happen in the future. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues or languages. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. So some people were given the gift to be able to speak another language. To others, they were given the gift to be able to understand what those tongues were. So I, I wonder how that worked, because I guess, you know, it'd be interesting that you'd think that if you understood something, Oh, no, that's, no, no, that, that even works today. I mean, because I think, you know, when I um, you know, think about Chinese, you know, I, I, you know, I, I understand it a bit, bit better than I can speak it. So maybe it's, it's the same thing. Like, you understand what people are saying, but they don't know how to phrase a sentence, you know. They've only given part of that gift, part of that ability when it comes to the language. So we see here that these gifts were given on, given on by the laying on of hands, and they were utilized by the laying on of hands. First Timothy 4 Paul talks about the gift that was given to Timothy. So Timothy in the New Testament, he had a spiritual gift, right? And the Bible says here in 1 Timothy 4, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Right? So not only was he ordained into the ministry as a bishop, right? He was also given a spiritual gift and he's saying here, neglect not the gift that is in thee. So it's interesting here that in the early church, even though people were given supernatural abilities, right, that they neglected those gifts. Like, like imagine if you, you had, you know, you'd think, man, if I had a supernatural ability, I'd probably use it for the kingdom of God. Wouldn't you think that? And, and it makes me think, why, why did Paul have to say to Timothy, hey, don't neglect the gift that is given you? Because I guess, you know, Timothy's, you know, he's a man just like us. That even though he's given some supernatural talent, he neglected it, right? But we do the same thing, don't we? You say, oh, yeah, well, I was given a supernatural ability. I'd use it to serve God. But you know, a lot of you are given specific talents, right? You're given certain talents, you know, whether it's speaking or people management or, you know, whatever, you know, that you, the things that you're good at, right? You're given those talents and abilities. And I think part of the... The, the verse here is trying to say to you today is neglect not the gift that is in thee. Right? You have talents and abilities and don't neglect to use them for the kingdom of God. And it's just interesting here that even supernatural gifts that were given to the early church were taken for granted. Right? Well, for you, maybe used for the wrong purpose. Neglect it. Um, don't neglect the gift that is in thee. Um, here, Timothy is given a supernatural gift. So let's go back on to the topic of laying out of hands. Now, Acts 8, I think, is a very telling story. And um, I'll get into now this story is why I think that these gifts no longer exist, right? Now, why they have ceased. And we'll see in the story here in Acts 8 what's happening. It says here, Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So what's happened in, in Acts 7? Acts 7 was the stoning of Stephen. Right, so there's persecution happening in the church. This is what the, 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 the epistle of James is referring to when he's saying the, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, greeting, right? So Acts 8 is now the church is being scattered. Now, you know, 
One is it was persecution from the Jews, but I think as well God allowed this persecution to wake the church up. Why? Because in the early church, they stayed in Jerusalem, right? And what did Jesus command them to do? I want you to be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea, and the other part of the earth. He didn't want just all the believers just in one spot or comfy in home. He wanted the gospel to get out there. Um, and that's why sometimes I think about, you know, the tough times that we've gone through in the last two years and how that gets Christians motivated and activated to actually do things. Sometimes God had to do that. He had to bring some persecution on the early church so they would actually scatter out and actually get to work doing what he had commanded them to do, which was preach the gospel. Then Philip went down. So when Philip, Acts 8, later on in the chapter, we're not going to get there in this sermon, but you know, that's the Ethiopian eunuch, the baptizer. So he's going around now preaching the gospel. Right? Philip was one of the uh, early deacons. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria, preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many, uh, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. So I want you to notice that, you know, Philip, as a deacon, had, his, had, had the apostles lay their hands on him, right? Because he was ordained as one of the seven. And we'll see that verse a bit later. So he's down in Samaria doing all these miracles because he has these gifts. And we, we, we looked about in, in, in the Corinthian passage before. And he's there confirming the word with signs following, like it says in Mark 16. Down there preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel healing people, casting out devils, doing all this stuff, right? Verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery. So this guy was trickery, right? Trickery and, I don't know, maybe whatever, you know, other spells that they have, whether it's from well, all this other stuff, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorcery. So there was somebody in Samaria called Simon, Simon the sorcerer, who was basically tricking everyone into thinking that he was somebody of God, but he was using sorcery, right? And he had been doing it for a long time. And now Philip comes in here, you know, doing real miracles and, you know, real, using the power of God, and he's preaching the gospel. Well, when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So he's down there preaching the gospel, baptizing a lot of people, doing all these miracles. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Right? So we see here that, you know, thankfully... Simon actually got saved, right? Simon the sorcerer who was bewitching these people for many, many, for a long, long time, right? He gets saved. You see here how he then believes. He, so then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip. So we know that this is a genuine salvation because this is not just the, 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 this is not just the Bible quoting that Simon's saying he believed. This is the Holy Ghost telling us Simon believed, right? So we know that this is genuine, right? Because the Holy Ghost knows the truth here. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now, right? So this is Steve. This, is, this was Philip down in Samaria, right? And Simon the sorcerer, who now has repented from his dead works and has put his faith in God, is believed, he's gotten baptized. He's now following Philip, right? And beholding... He's seeing all these things that are going on, right? And you know, as he's healing people, he's laying hands on people and all that sort of stuff. Now, when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, right? So now they hear what's going on in Samaria, all the great work that Philip's doing down there. They send two of the apostles, Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Right? So Philip's down there, baptizing them in the name of the Lord Jesus, doing all these miracles, getting them saved. Right? 
But what does it say here? They haven't yet received any gifts from the Holy Ghost, right? Like when the apostles would lay hands on them, then they would speak with tongues. They would have the, the same gifts that like Philip would have, or, you know, a different variation of them. So it says there in verse 16, For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Right? Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Right? This is now John and, uh, John and Peter, right? They're coming down from Jerusalem. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered the money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Now, this is, what, this is the story I was reading when I was thinking about this topic, where I realized, you know, why didn't Simon ask Philip for this? Like, why didn't Simon ask Philip, you know, Philip, can you lay your hands on me and give me this same power that you had? Although, but there was something different about the apostles. The, the apostles had the power to impart these spiritual gifts. But what I believe is the people that received these spiritual gifts, they could not then pass them on. They could only just then use the spiritual gift given to them. And that's what I think was the difference between the apostles and why now we no longer see this because the last apostle was Paul, right? So Paul was able to give a gift to Timothy, but I don't think Timothy was able to pass those on. And that's why I see here Simon the sorcerer, he saw something different that when the apostles laid their hands on people, there was a different power that they had that others that just had gifts of the Spirit didn't have, right? So what's happening here? Simon the sorcerer is offering John and Peter some money to say, hey, can I have this power, right? So that whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. When Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. So there's a double meaning here, right? Because one meaning is that, you know, you're not going to get this power, right? This gift that in order to you know, purchase with money. But we know the second meaning to this is that the gift of God is eternal life. The principle here is you can't buy eternal life. Like, you know, sometimes uh, in the, I think in the Catholic Church, they have the indulgences, right? And I remember watching a movie once where every, they say like every time they hear the coin chink in, in the bottom of the jar or whatever, that's so many years off purgatory. I mean, that's this idea of purchasing your salvation. And Peter's saying here, thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God, remember kids this morning we learned about the gift of God? Gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. So that's a, that's a good lesson there as well. See, people think, hey, if I can just do a little bit of work, you know, that'll, that'll earn me some favor with God. But we know that salvation is by grace, it's not by works. You're trying to earn any of it, you have neither part nor lot in this matter. So that's the application to salvation. But here he's saying, no. You, it's like, what he's saying here now is, like, you're not even going to get a spiritual gift. So you're not going to buy the power to impart the spiritual gift. But when he's saying, you're neither, neither part nor lot in this matter, he's saying, you know, now, you, you know, you may not even get a spiritual gift at all. For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought on thine heart may be forgiven thee. Now remember, Peter and John have come down from Jerusalem. They don't know who Simon the sorcerer is, right? Like, they don't know. So, do they know whether he's saved or not? No. They're just saying, like, don't have this wicked thought of trying to buy the gift of God with money, right? Otherwise, you won't have any part or lot in it. But, but what do we? We know that Simon is saved, right? So this is not Peter telling, like, Peter doesn't know whether Simon the sorcerer is saved, but we know he's saved, right? So this, at this point here, this is not when Simon gets saved. He was already saved, right? So he's telling him to repent of this thought that he's having, which is buying gifts from God. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. So you see how he's saying, that's I'm judging that maybe you're not saved if you're thinking you can buy the gift of God with money. But we know that he is saved. He's just asked for the wrong thing here. Verse 24. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. Right, so he has the right response there, where he basically, you know, is 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 uh, asking for forgiveness for what he's asked for wrongly. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. 
So there are many ways people argue for why gifts have ceased. Um, you know, and, and it's something that people wonder because you say, well, like, why do we see in Acts, in the New, in the New Testament, and, and well, in the book of Acts, we see like in the early church, like things that are miraculously happening and why don't they happen today? And then you have churches like the Pentecostal church, the apostolic church, and those that have, that's why they called the apostolic church, right? Because they still believe that apostles are still ordained and they have this power, right? But we know that Paul is the, ch the last apostle, right? In 1 Corinthians 15. So, and we see here in Acts 8 that there is a difference between Philip, who had a gift of the, of the Holy Spirit, and the apostles when they came, right? Because why didn't, why didn't Philip just lay his hands on them and give them the gift of the Holy Ghost? Why did Peter and John have to come down to give them the gift of the Holy Ghost, right? So you see here that there is something different and like I said, Simon the sorcerer noticed that and that's why he offered money to the apostles. He knew there was something different about the apostles than just disciples that had spiritual gifts, right? Acts 19, here is Paul giving the Holy Ghost after baptism, right, in Jesus' name. So we know that baptism, some people believe that baptism in, uh, you know, baptizing somebody in the name of Jesus, they think that's the laying out of hands and imparting these spiritual gifts. But we can see that they are separate. Because you remember in Acts 8, they were already baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John come down and give them the gift of the Holy Ghost, right? And we see here in Acts 19, the same thing. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So you see there, Paul was able to impart a spiritual gift onto these disciples. But I don't believe that they could pass that on further. 2 Corinthians 12, look at this. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Right, so you see how there are signs of an apostle that are different to just you know, regular signs. So the signs of an apostle. So that's number two. Number two is the transfer of spiritual gifts. I guess they would utilize their spiritual gifts as well. And hopefully that gives you a good explanation of why I believe we don't see those gifts today. Right? Not only I think have they ceased, but I think God intentionally made them temporary. Why? Because they were initially given to confirm the word with signs following. We have the word today. The word has been confirmed. It's been copied. and There's no question about where God's word is, right? That's why there's no need to confirm it anymore. The word is there. It just needs to be taught and preached and believed upon. All right, last one. Last one, number three. The laying out of hands is used as a transfer of authority. And this is the one that's most relevant in the New Testament, right? Because as we, you know, transfer authority to people, you know, we will ordain other bishops, ordain deacons. You see the laying out of hands used symbolically to transfer that authority to somebody else. So it's that, it's that visual symbolization, right? Um, of transferring of one thing to another. And I think it just comes from the fact that, you know, they would use the laying out of hands to impart the Holy Ghost, that that symbolism is a very powerful symbolism. That's why people, you know, they'll lay their hands on them to bless them. They'll lay their hands on them to ordain them. They'll lay their hands on them when they pray for them. You know, things like that. So this is a, this is a practice of Christianity, even though it's practiced somewhat, you know, some, it's practiced incorrectly by some denominations. So the transfer of authority. Let's look at a story in Numbers 27, verse 15. This is when Moses lays his hand on Joshua to appoint him, right, as the new leader of the nation of Israel. Because remember, Moses was not allowed to go into the promised land because the second time when he was meant to speak to the rock that brought forth water, he struck the rock the second time. And because of that, he was uh, not allowed into the promised land. He could only view it from the mountain. And then, you know, God took his body, right? And he was actually, nobody knows where he was buried. Now here is where he's saying to God, because he knows that he's not going to go into this promised land. It says, Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation. So you see, it's God's 
God's way, there's always somebody at the top, right? There's always a leader. Which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. Right? So you can see here that even in this passage, that, you know, God's will is that his sheep have a shepherd. You know, there's a movement that goes on these days that people just you know, they start their own churches. It's just, you know, just people within a house and they just get together and they think, oh, you know, we don't have to have a leader. It's like a leaderless church. We're all just equal here. That's not how God wants things. God has a man in charge, right? He put Moses in charge. He had a king in charge of the nation of Israel. That's why there's always the ideal situation is that there's always a leader in every church, right? That's leading the congregation. And, you know, the people that believe in this, you know, leaderless church, it's, it's, a, it's a pipe dream anyway, because what happens in these leaderless churches is that somebody inevitably rises up as the leader. They're just the unappoint, unappointed leader. And you probably experience the same thing at work, right? You, the same thing at work in any situation where there's a group of people and there's a void of leadership, that's, that's dangerous, right? Because then somebody just rises to the top. It's the, usually the loudest, the most authoritarian, right? rather than somebody who's either appointed properly um, or elected you know, in, in, a, in a democratic society. So he's saying here to bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him. Set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation and give him a charge in their sight. So not only did he lay hands on Joshua, right? He also charged him, right? What does that mean? Gave him instruction, saying, do this, do that. Thou shalt put, and here's a verse 20, sort of like what I want to focus on, on this point three, which is the transfer of authority. It says, thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. So that's sort of what that, that visual public symbolism is, is that some of your honour is imparted onto this person. It's like your association saying, like you have been put in charge and it's based on my authority. <clears throat> and he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim, before the Lord, and, his, and at his word shall they go out, and at his word shall they come in, both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him. And he took Joshua and set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation. And he laid his hands upon him and gave him a charge as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. So we see there the transfer of authority in the Old Testament nation of Israel that Moses was leading as he appoints that new leader. And that's why churches do it the same today right and this is why like you know we don't believe in our church in you know it's, it's we don't have dem democracy dem democratically elected leaders in church that's not the way it's meant to work in churches it's meant to be appointed leadership right so that's why some churches they 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 try and pattern their church after the world right and they say well you know society has democracy so church should be a democracy but there are there are problems with democracy right so church is not meant to be like that. Church is meant to be appointed leadership and it works like that in the New Testament as well. Now, not only did Joshua um, receive authority and honour from Moses, but he also, because Moses was a prophet too, he also received the spiritual gift, right? Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands upon him, right? So not only was Joshua already filled with the spirit, Right? He got the authority, got the honour from Moses, but he also got an extra dose of wisdom right? because Moses had laid his hands upon him and the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. So this is a great picture here in the Old Testament of how God has leadership and we see as well in the New Testament this same pattern follow. And what's the obligation of the congregation? The, ob the obligation of the congregation is to respect that structure, right? Respect that hierarchy where if somebody has been ordained, you show them the respect and the, I guess, obedience in the context of church to that office, right? We see here that the nation of Israel was expected now to follow Joshua as they had followed Moses. Why? Because this is how God had ordained it. Let's go into the New Testament now where we see the laying out of hands used as an ordination into positions of leadership. 
as I mentioned before, with Philip in Acts 8, right? He was ordained in, as one of the early deacons. This is where it happened in Acts 6. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So you can see here that leadership in the church, it, it doesn't, have, doesn't mean that it's void of feedback from the congregation. Because we see here the first deacons, the first seven deacons that were ordained, it was feedback from the congregation. So you could say, you know, uh, you know, the congregation, you know, figures out hey, who is recognized among them, give them their nominations, and, but it's ultimately the leaders in the church, the apostles at the time, they were the ones that appointed them, right? They had the authority to appoint or to veto those decisions, right? Whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So you see, in small churches, it's not an ideal scenario where you have the ones that are committed to the ministry of the word and to prayer doing all the administrative tasks. And this is why in larger churches, there are men appointed to the office of a deacon, which is to do those administrative tasks, right? And in the early church, a lot of it was about serving the food. You know, a lot of that was about, you know, probably back then it's a lot harder right you can't just order food get delivered put it in a fridge there's probably a lot more in terms of preparation and storage and logistics and serving people cleaning up you know you can't just chuck everything in an industrial dishwasher you know in these large churches it's probably all that stuff that needs to be done but at the beginning you know the apostles were doing all those things and they're saying hey we need to appoint men over this business so the apostles can go about preaching right preaching the ministry of the word and give themselves to prayer and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, there's Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, and, uh, and Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. So it doesn't specifically say in this passage that they were deacons, but that's what a lot of people believe, that these were the early deacons. Acts 13, let's just look at another few other examples, and then we'll be done. Acts 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them, they sent them away. You see here that this transfer of authority is not always just into an office, right? The transfer of authority can be, you know, we're sending you to do a task. So we are charging you, sending you off. You have the authority to do this task, right? As Barnabas and Saul went off. First Timothy 5. So here, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Against an elder, I'm just giving you the context here, all the context is about, you know, bishops in the church. Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin, rebuke before all, that others also may fear. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one, another, without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. In verse two, 22, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partakers of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. So what is he saying here? So one of Timothy's jobs, as we saw also in, in Titus, if you go back and read Titus chapter 1, their jobs was to set things in order, or ordain elders in every city. Paul says, as I had appointed thee. So he's saying here to Timothy that you need to appoint elders in every city like I appointed you, but saying lay hands on no man suddenly so he's saying like you know just be, be careful with who you lay your hands on and you know and there's a vetting process right there are requirements they need to meet and don't do it too quickly right you want to appoint people um correctly not just appointing you know every, every everyone you know it's like in bible college it's just as long as you as long as you pass the bible college you know everyone just gets ordained into the ministry right and it's like not looking at their characters just looking at their test scores you know so you don't we don't want to do that and Acts 14, verse 23, says, And when they had ordained them elders in every church, and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord, on whom they believed. Okay? So, in conclusion, hopefully you learned 
a lot about there on the laying out of hands. You know, I don't, I don't hear a lot of sermons on the laying out of hands, um, but it's interesting that it's, a, it's, one of, it's considered one of the principles of the oracles of Christ. So you know, it's something you want to know about. I think it, it is important in the sense of you know, why we don't see these spiritual gifts today like we do. And, and you know, is, it, is laying of hands completely done away with? No, because there is an area where laying out of hands is still utilized, and that is in the transfer of authority. So we've got the transfer of blessing, we've got the transfer of spiritual gifts, execution of spiritual gifts, and then we've got the transfer of authority, whether that's into an office or whether that's to do a spiritual work. All right, so I hope you learned something there today. Let's pray. Lord, well, thank you for your word. Um, I thank you for the Bible. I thank you for you know these um, you know this guidance that you give us and these and these uh, this information you give us in the word, so that we can understand these principles of the doctrine of Christ. I pray, Lord, that uh, you know this uh, this sermon will be uh, useful for the people uh, in our church, Lord. I pray, Lord, that that will just teach them more about your word and teach them more about your ways and um lord we thank you for the lord jesus christ thank you for teaching us thank you for your spirit uh, we pray these things in his precious name amen